Good morning. My name is Eric Johnson. I'm a veterinarian in Marietta, Georgia, with a specialty in fish health, dog and cat veterinarian as well. It is very early in the morning, and uh, anyway, uh, my reason for this video is one of the 20 steps in the assessment of fish diseases, and it seems obscure but it happens to be assessment of the fish and pond for obstacles. And that's right. It has a, a, little, a pretty good bit more to do with pond fish than it does with tropical fish tanks. Um, although there are obstacles in tropical fish tanks, um, I can think of at least three areas that uh, would compose obstacles in a tropical fish tank. One is the... Uh, when you're using a um, backdrop, sometimes there's um, backdrops of, of uh, fish tanks that actually go inside the tank and they create a textured surface. Sometimes those lift away from the back and fish will get stuck in there, uh, causing a person to think their fish are disappearing from some disease. And in, in fact, they're behind your, uh, terminally behind your um, backdrop for your fish tank. So check there. Um, Sometimes if you have things right up against the glass, uh, especially dense plants, plastic plants usually, the fish can get in there and, and jammed and stuck. And uh, so that would be an obstacle to consider avoiding. Uh, but mainly in um, pond environments, you'll get a call that uh, where a person says, my fish are getting sores. And you'll go out and do all your water quality assessments and but before you home in on uh, bacteria ulcers and parasites and all that other stuff assuming water quality is good one of the things to consider is the possibility that there are obstacles in the pond that the fish are harming themselves on and there are kind of a bunch um, that could get coy and and uh, give them marks all over the place I would say the most common of those is, and I would say in practice, I've, I've heard of this a couple times a month, is where the uh, pond has sharp obstacles like rocks and things. And we need to be careful on that because smooth rocks are not a problem. Uh, smooth gravel on the bottom of the pond, unless it's neglected, is not a problem. But people use sharp rocks because sometimes sharp rocks like slate stack well and they'll create um, uh, with cinder blocks or slate they'll create little hides for the fish to get under or in well here's the thing those fish aren't stupid they're not just running into those things and causing lesions what sometimes happens is the fish will get startled and make a dart for it this is especially true at night when they're sleeping um, their reflex, basically, if something scares them, is to dart forward. It uh, obviously keeps them out of the uh, the uh, deadly cave squid's mouth, the chulu. Um, well, when they dart forward, if there are obstacles in the tank that they could, uh, or the pond that they could run into, they will. And a lot of times with that, you'll see cuts in the, the head, uh, mouth, eye, leading half of the body, but by the same token, there are obstacles because sometimes people use slate stacked on the edge of the pond. And uh, even to the extent that when the fish come up to eat, they're just literally swarming this piece of slate at the edge of the pond that you're sitting on and cutting themselves up. Um, and it's not terribly common. I mean, give me a break. They have scales and they have a slime coat, but it adds up. So... Um, those would be two areas, the, the bottom at night and uh, around feeding time, you could run into some uh, cuts from certain kinds of aggregate that are used um, in a uh, pond environment. Um, so look out for sharp or edgy rocks and don't hesitate for a second to use round boulders. They're fine. If you ever tried to stand in a pond with boulders like that, you know it's just about impossible. It turns into a giant wet t-shirt contest, falling and slipping. Um, other obstacles um, 
can be uh, breeding time, then it doesn't really take that much in the way of sharp rocks or hardly anything. The fish can get a significant abrasions. And you might go, well, what does that mean? Um, it means that if you go out to see a pond with sick fish in it that have sores that are usually ventrally located or fresh cuts in the head and face, um, one of the considerations would be, is it breeding time? Uh, and if it's in the vicinity of breeding, it's not a bad idea to ask the owner if you've seen the fish running each other, the uh, two or three fish chasing one of the fish into stuff or up against things because that's their breeding behavior. Uh, the female can't just naturally push eggs out. She has to do an abdominal press and or a significant body wiggle. And to do that, she, um, uh, the male uh, or males tend to, uh, tend to uh, wiggle uh, the, the, the female into a, a uh, contained position. And then when she pushes to get away, uh, her eggs will, will come out and then the male can fertilize those. There's the birds and the bees of the koi. And that's breeding behavior and there can be injuries involved in that. Um, uh, there's another obstacle that you'll see and uh, it's, it's, this is uncommon, but it happens. Um, people ha will have skimmers. Um, there's a round skimmer in particular that sticks up from a pipe on the bottom. It's a nifty invention. I really, I approve. Um, but fish can get in there. Uh, fish can get in there head first. And if they do, they're going to create, if they stick out of the skimmer, they're going to create a ring of abrasion around wherever their tail uh, or base of their tail hits the edge of the skimmer, if that makes any sense. It'd be like putting a... Uh, uh, putting a pencil in a coffee mug and s swirling it around and then that pencil would get a score on it from the edge of the coffee mug. Well, that's what happened to one of the fish I looked at. It had gotten in the skimmer, a round skimmer, and it had struggled and created a ring of lesion around the base of its tail, somehow managed to turn around and jump out. And uh, it, was, it was just an interesting lesion. And then we figured out that it was the, uh, the skimmer. Uh, that had done that. Do I suggest that you don't have skimmers? No, I, I think skimmers are awesome. Uh, take your chances. Um, so assess the pond for obstacles because that's where a lot of uh, random sores in otherwise healthy fish come from. And uh, typically, if you see healthy fish with good body language and they're eating and doing well, or it's not really the time of year for ulcers like early spring, and you see a fish with a lesion, uh, quite often it's been inflicted. It's not uh, just a sore that's shown up, uh, especially if it's a lone actor. Uh, we did see a batch of fish that had been speared and stabbed and scratched by some herons. Uh, that's not an uncommon uh, thing. In this case, though, it was sort of uncommon because uh, that was when I learned that uh, young herons will uh, sport fish um, practice in an environment that is so amazing as a koi pond, uh, very attractive colors and all of that. And uh, I've joked before that herons know quality better than judges do. Uh, they can pick out your most expensive and rarest uh, patterned fish better than uh, anybody. Those are the ones that they're going to spear, stab, or eat. And uh, so a young heron will eat a fish and once satisfied will then practice spear fishing. Uh, that's, a, you know, uh, practice makes perfect, I suppose. The adult birds don't tend to linger. Uh, once they eat, they have a tendency to decide to vacate and go to a safer environment. Um, but there's one other thing about herons, and this isn't the subject of this video, but whatever. I told you to have a pen and paper handy. Um, I'll just toss out there two things about herons. One is that herons are territorial in a good way and a bad way. Um, sometimes, during certain parts of the year, if you put herons out, uh, heron scares, fake herons on the edge of your pond, the, um, a heron will be flying overhead and will look down and see a nice looking pond with maybe some brightly colored fish in it or whatever. And uh, then they'll see the heron 
the fake heron on the side of the uh, pond and make the decision that, in fact, um, fishing must be good and come down and, and uh, dine as well. So herons can backfire that way. Normally what you're counting on with a scare heron is that the bird will look down and have its typical response, and that is, I don't like other birds. I'm not going to go down there. And uh, that works a pretty good bit. Other times when it's uh, breeding season for the herons, which I have no idea when that is because I'm not a, a, a birdologist. So I think they call that an ornithologist. Um, they, uh, they, 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 uh, whenever they breed, they, they could be attracted, uh, especially to each other. Um, herons will also do this thing, and this has a, a bearing on another fish health situation, and it was uncommon, but it happens. Herons will eat fish of a particular size. It could be a mess of small ones or one or two really big ones. And if they get scared, they have to fly away. And if they sense that they're uh, laden with food in their crop or whatever the hell parts of a heron are where they eat the fish and they're, they're loaded, they'll regurgitate some of the fish or all the fish that they just ate. And uh, the reason that matters is because there was one case, we think for sure one case, and then possibly one other case where a heron had loaded up got scared and flew away over another pond next door and had started regurgitating fish to lighten its load and then regurgitated infected fish into the secondary pond. And because uh, that was a pretty interesting case. It was a koi herpes virus outbreak in one pond and there was a koi herpes virus outbreak in another pond. And the question was, well, how in the heck um, one person had bought new fish and the other one had not. And then it was discovered that some of the, some or one of the first neighbor's fish were in the other pond and they had remarked that there was a heron flying around. It was uh, unusual, but I guess if you see enough cases, you're going to see the freaky stuff like that. What was the, oh, obstacles. Yeah. Okay. So uh, sharp rocks, try not to use so much slate, use round boulders there. That that's obstacles. And then there's other a whole bunch of other little stuff that cut them up, like, and that's how we got onto herons. So, just assess as to whether or not the fish are actually dealing with um, actual sores or whether they're just being cut up. And that's it for this subject. Let's move on to the next one.